Welcome back to the Latino Athlete Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. Uh, this gentleman's mission is to educate the underrepresented communities, people of color, uh, help them understand money, help them understand finance. He is an author, has written multiple books. Please welcome Pedro Frias. I'm good, man. You know, uh, trying to survive in these these crazy, crazy times we're having all over the, the world with Corona, with the protests, with everything else going on. But I'm doing good, man. I'm doing real good. Excited to be here. Thank you so much. So we, we start, uh, we have a tradition. We start all our um, interviews, our chats, our conversation with trying to understand um, the person that we bring on board. And I think what we talked about offline and, and what we talk to all our guests is, you know, Latino athletes as a, as a platform to celebrate uh, and also inspire the youth. And I think you're doing that with the work uh, that you're doing that on, on your own. So we want to first start with, with, your with your background yeah please tell us a little bit about who is Pedro Frias yeah uh so for one I'm Dominican that's why you know we could be family got the same last name Frias uh my mom's from La Romana my dad's from Santo Domingo and they moved here back to New York City in Manhattan and moved to Boston and that's where I was born and raised in Boston you know I was born and raised there um you know, growing up, I was the dude that I would be, I would go to New York with my family and I would go visit cousins and stuff. And I would go by Wall Street and Wall Street, you know, I'm 32. When I was going to Wall Street, it was like the thing. Everybody wanted to go work in the big banks. You'd go to the Wall Street and you'd see everything kind of up and it was like the mirror of success, hedge funds and all that. So I was like, man, that's where I want to go. That's where people are making money. So I wanted to go work and be a banker. And my uncle was a broker. His name is Ramon Frias. He was a broker. He was a real estate investor. He was a, he actually became CEO of the Better Business Bureau. And he was kind of like my mentor. And he, he kind of taught me the business game, the investing game, how to raise capital, how to organize deals. He took me as a kid. I was a guy that he thought I was a dude in, in New York running around. And he'd bring me to these meetings. And I was like, damn, that's, that's what I want to do. So went to school for finance. Uh, I actually had, for me, it wasn't kind of straight through. I, you know, went to college, flunked out three times. I was a club promoter in Atlanta and that was okay, my first ATL, course, ATL hot Atlanta. And this was when <laughs> this was, I was bad. I, I, 18, 19, I actually started my own company with one of my boys who's out here now, who's the founder of a company. We started a, a, a promotion company called Red Star Entertainment. And we set up in Jermaine Dupree's club in Atlanta. It was called Studio 72. And we were bringing celebrities down. We were bringing Tyrese, Jay-Z, Usher. We had a ton of them. The only problem was I would go after the club during the week and I tried to go to school work and I couldn't do any school work. So they kicked me out. So I uh, went back to Boston. I, I self-funded my education. Um, got a job in uh, Morgan Stanley first. And I, I was on a multi-billion dollar team where we would manage monies for millionaires and billionaires in the Boston region. It was like uh, close to over $2 billion. And then I worked at Merrill Lynch and I was a junior partner at Merrill Lynch where you know, I raised close to 30 to 40 million in, in, uh, in assets from scratch. And a lot of them were, uh, you know, people in the community, people from different backgrounds, people who sold companies. The one thing I did learn when I was in banking was that while, you know, it's good to kind of, you know, get the financial knowledge, savviness of the markets and understand how to organize deals and fundraise. For me, the biggest takeaway was like, I was on the wrong side of the table because I would see people, I kept seeing people 26, 27, 45, I brought in a tech founder. He, he started an application in New York. It was in the retail space and he sold it for like 3 million bucks. And he said it took him three or four years. And I was like, man, I, I'm, I, even though I was making good money, I was making you know decent money. I was like, I'm on the wrong side of the table. And he would tell me that. He goes, bro, this stuff's going to be automated. And I, that kind of stuff kind of kept clicking for me. And eventually I quit, you know, moved to the Bay. I moved to the Bay. I left it behind, worked at two venture back startups, one by Google one by Salesforce and a few others, Twilio. I helped scale those out. We started off at um, a little bit under 100, 100K in, in uh, annual recurring revenue. I helped scale them out to a little bit over 20 million in five or six different um, sales channels. I then left, Google recruited me. Google wanted me to bring on as a senior strategist. And uh, during the time they cut me a really good check. So, you know, I took it. And, um, you know, during a time where you start thinking about how can you give back to the community? How can you do things? You know, one of the things we were talking about offline is that, you know, it's more important for us to kind of create our own platforms versus kind of being a chess piece in a big system. And, you know, the one thing we learn is ownership is the only way. And more and more and more, I'm learning that, especially for the Latino community, the black and brown community, is that we need to, especially, you know, those that 
do have opportunities to, to create things that I feel like you have an obligation to create things. And that leads me to what I'm working on now, which is um, Blacklist. And Blacklist is, is basically going to be the next Bloomberg, the next CNBC for the, for the community. It's going to be built for us. It's going to be built by us. The content oh, yeah, for our bias. It's, uh, I'm gonna, I want to give people the same kind of information that the, the billionaires and the billionaires will get when it comes to the markets and it comes to owning and investing and bring that down to the people because that's something that we don't have. How did you get into Morgan Stanley, right? Morgan Stanley was your, your first job. How was the process for you uh, to get your first job and get basically your foot in, in, in the door in the uh, financial industry? Well, for me, it was probably similar to most people. I mean, I had crappy grades. I didn't have any connections. I didn't know anybody. And they definitely, you know, when you're talking about Boston, you're talking about Harvard, MIT, all these schools. I went to Nichols College and I was, they, they were never, if I went to the, just the, the same process, that everybody went to, they would have been like reject. They would have put me in the system and it would have just been automatic rejection. And I kind of knew that going in. And that's some of those skills that I learned as a club promoter and kind of in the street hustling, like you, you can apply to business. And it's like you, the, the path that the, the, the herd goes through is not going to work for everybody, especially if you don't come from that background. So for me, the way I got in is I sent a cold email on a Sunday night to the head of all the Northeast. And I've gotten every single job this way, by the way. Something I tell everybody. Yeah. I've gotten every single job I've gotten through just cold outreach, cold emailing and networking. I sent a cold email out to the head. They brought me in for an interview. I sat down with the head of a team. He was managing, personally managed 750 million. And they sat down with me in the interview and they could tell I was like a street dude. I didn't even know what I was talking about. But I remember I sat down with him and I asked him, like, how did you get where you are? And I just want to say, is it book smarts? Is it street smarts? And then he told me his story. That he, he, was a, he was a Blanco, he was a white guy, but he grew up the poor white guy in a white town, which can be sometimes even worse. And he said that drove him, it kind of pushed him, and, and there was a lot of that. We had that kind of commonality. Once we had that conversation, I closed the deal and he hired me. Can you explain exactly what you did to get that interview? Yeah, so what I did is a cold email is basically, you don't know this person, I don't know you, you don't know me, and I'm sending you like that marketing email you would reach in your inbox. The difference is, is when you send a cold email, the way you're gonna get people to respond is you have to make your email not look like the other 50 to 100 marketing emails they get. And what that means is you gotta be real, you gotta be you. So my emails are very clean, they almost look like a text, so they don't look like a big spammy long, my name is Pedro Frias, da, 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 da. it wasn't like that. It was very clean, Hi, the, uh, the, the headline is meeting, something very quick. And I, I schedule one or two words because I know their boss is going to be flooded with other crap and it's going to stick out. And it's going to look like it's coming from a person. And then secondly, um, I don't want to say contextual because I know that's not the right word to use, but I'm going to say <laughs> it has to be relevant to the person that you're talking to. So if you're going to reach out to me, if you say, you know, you talk about something about being Dominican from Boston, something really relevant to me, that's, you know, something about my background and we have in common, I'm gonna be more likely to open and to respond because it's gonna feel like it's coming from a human versus a feeling like coming from a machine. So it has to be well written, it has to be clear cut. You don't want it long form and you wanna clearly set your intentions of why you're setting it. I'm reaching out to setting a, a meeting with you. Notice two or three things about your background. This is a little bit about my background. Do you have a few minutes next week? I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. And, um, you know, and for the most part, that, that has worked for me. It's worked for me um, in, in every single job that I've got. So um, two things. The, this is the way I did it. The way I did it back in the day was very manual. It's not like now. So I'm going to tell you I did it before, and then I'll also say how you can do it now using some technologies. And I'll name the technologies for everybody to add. So you, back in the day, you'd have to Google it. You'd have to experiment. You'd have to send three or four, and they would bounce. First name, that last name at morganstanley.com, right? And you'd have to guess. And you can look up in databases and, and you can see how like the majority of the emails are written out. What I would do now, and this is what I teach people to do now, is there's technology. One of them is called scrap.io. It's free. You can download it. It can be an extension to your LinkedIn account. And basically what it does, is you can hover over somebody's LinkedIn account. It doesn't matter who they are, what company it is. It'll hover and it'll extract their email and you can get their email and now you can just send them a note, you get their email. And for most big companies, it's going to have their contact information. And it's called scrap, S-K-R-A-P-P dot I-O. 
And I've been recommending people to do this for fundraising. I've been recommending people for job interviews. You can literally sc scrape somebody's email from the internet and it's free. Oh, that, that's, a, that's amazing. That's a good one. I didn't know that one. I knew, um, I think it was uh, called Hunter. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, use yeah. Hunter, which is also an extension uh, to get some, some emails and some contact information from folks um, in, the, in the workforce. Uh, so you joined Mor um, Morgan Stanley. I would suspect that you are probably one of a few uh, minorities in your team and in your floor and in the company. How was that experience? It was, so this, I know we, we talk a lot about this, about this offline, but I'm the kind of person that, like when I go into a situation, even if I am the underdog, because I was considering myself like an underdog, you know, I go into it fighting and, and if is, I am- is that, a boss, is that a Boston thing, feeling like the underdog? It's a Boston, it's definitely, it's a Boston thing, you know, it's like we, 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 we just work our asses off and it's like a great, and New York has it too, New York, but Boston is like, sometimes it's not even smarter, you just work harder and that's something too, I always got to think, said, man, maybe I'm doing too much, but you know, that experience for me was, it was challenging, you're in a place where um, the majority of people are super connected, you know, they went to the best schools, you know, I'm Dominican, I usually know I flunked out of college multiple times, I didn't say this, but I defaulted on $20,000 in student loans before that. Wow. And um, I was sued by the government and I lost and they, you know, it was a big problem and I was, you know, 23, 24, you know, so. Wait a second, it, so you got sued by the government while you worked at Morgan or before you worked at Morgan Stanley? Before. When I was at Morgan, I had that judgment there because that's when I finally started making real money. Mm -hmm. But when um, when I, I left that school, the one I told you I was a club promoter in Atlanta, you know, I didn't pay that loan back. And there was a little mix up with the day. I went back to Boston, never paid it. I got a bill in. Next, you know, I said, you defaulted. And I was like, oh. And I was like, you know, I got a heat at the time. So I didn't really know anything. I was like, oh, all right, well, I guess fine, whatever. I'll ride wait the seven years. <laughs> and um, it, it became, uh, it was a problem. You know, when I applied, they sent an email out with every judgment against me and they said, explain this, right? That comes back to the credit side. Um, but I was, like I said, I, I, for me, I, I, I think the advantage that I had going into these places, I always had the self-confidence and also having confidence and also having like a, a humility where I don't care what people think, but at the same time, I, I'm gonna go into a situation to win. And that was the mentality I had at Morgan Stanley on the floor. I had a chip on my shoulder. So they, were, they told me in the beginning, for example, when I was trying to raise money, they said, oh, go to, go to the black and brown, go to, you should work with African-Americans. You should work with the Latinos. And I was like, I'm gonna do that, but I can work with anybody. It doesn't matter what it is. And this is in a town that in Boston, which everybody says is racist. And the first few deals that I brought in, and when I brought in a $2 million deal, it was from an old white dude in Connecticut who sold, he's the other company who sold it. And they were always very surprised by that. Um, but it, it, again, I, I think it comes from uh, just having the self-confidence and knowing that you belong in those circles. Got it. And uh, so while you're growing your career, you're growing your influence, you're growing your network uh, in Boston, in basically, which is your home, uh, at what point did you think or decide uh, there's something bigger out there you know, I want to give it a shot and, you know, I want to go to the West Coast and, and make something happen there. Yeah, uh, I had a client that I brought on when I was at Merrill Lynch and he was a young, like, he was a young dude. He was like 25 years old and he, he sold like a company. It was a, it was a retail application that would almost like track people coming in and out of stores and that using those data points and he sold that company. Somebody I got actually from a cold email, I actually set up a meeting from a cold email in Boston, but when I brought him on, we had a conversation and he was like, you look, you're a young buck. And without the beard, I look like I'm like 19. And at that time, it was even worse. <laughs> I looked like, like, a, like a carajito. And he said, if I were you, he was like, I would go do, he goes, you're on the wrong seat of the table. Tech is hot. Like your job is going to be, it's not even going to be around in 15 years. An algorithm is going to do this for everybody. And this, that whole scam is going to be over. And I was like, damn, this dude, you know, I saw he was doing something right and I saw what he did and it kind of planted a seed in my brain where I said, I saw the way of the technology coming and I saw the, what was actually going to happen. And I kind of thought 10 to 15 years down the road that I needed to get out of this space because there's a very old school space with a lot of old school processes and paper based processes. 
So I guess what led me to leave and when I finally made the decision was like, I knew if I wanted to be in tech and I wanted to be in the game that I needed to be not on the East Coast. East Coast is big for finance. It's big for um, banking. A lot of those careers, pharmaceuticals is very big in Boston. They got a huge pharma community. But I knew that if I was going to do tech and I wasn't do tech young and I was do tech right, I need to do it on the West Coast. And that's where the biggest fun was. It was hot at the time. There were so many unicorns that were kind of popping up left and right. Venture money was just hot. And I knew I could go to the West Coast and really watch something young, uh, early, you know, very early product, a radical idea be built out and actually be taken serious. Where in Boston... Let me, let me, let me, let me stop you right there. And yeah. You mean you went to San Francisco because there's real unicorns in San Francisco? There's real you explain what can you explain what a unicorn is? Yeah, unicorn is it's a it's a it's a company that and I gotta be this is a thing where I get so trapped. I'm so in this bubble over yeah. here. This is what my family says, like, man, you just only talk. I'm like, yeah. Um, but a unicorn is essentially it's it's a it's a billion dollar company, a company valued at a billion dollars. And I saw that out here there was just a higher probability of building something that big. And for a number of reasons, like one, um, you know, people had the opportunity to raise the kind of money necessary to build a company of that size on the West Coast versus the East Coast where it's a lot, there's a lot more barriers to do that. And um, I knew on the, on the West Coast that there was just going to be a lot more opportunities to do that and also to be taken serious. You know, there was a few unicorns at the time that were even just random ideas in fitness, you know, and things that um, on the West, on the East Coast, there would just be no, no, um, there'd be no chance of you ever be taken serious with an idea like that. The first idea I want to launch is what I'm launching right now. And I've been working on it for a little bit over two years. And for me, one of the reasons why I picked financial literacy and um, it's from my own experience. You know, like I said, I, I defaulted on over $20,000 and I went through hell from not understanding small little details. And I see how those small little details can really hit us and hurt us. And it's similar to what's going on now with the coronavirus, right? where a lot of us don't have the preventative care. We don't know who our primary care doctor is. We don't have access to these things. So there's just a lot of um, access to information and access to things that other communities do have. And I want to make sure that our community had it. You know, uh, something I always talk about is in my family, you know, most of them don't even have retirement accounts. Some of them don't, you know, they don't have, they don't even know what a stock is. They have no idea even where to start. And I'm kind of mixed between two worlds where I grew up and all these other people out here. And I, I don't forget about that. I don't forget about where I came from. And, and that's this idea now with Blacklist. And what I wanna do with Blacklist is I'm gonna build a community, which I do have, I have a little bit over 24,000. I have a little bit over 2,000 subscribers to my uh, newsletter. Um, I published two books. One of them is called Broke Broken, which basically breaks down. I wanted to break down the experience of what you would get if you were to go to an office with $100,000 or $10,000, like where would you start? What does that process look like? So the same process you'd get through in a, a firm or if you go walk into a Merrill Lynch, this is the same process they would walk you through and break down every single piece of the game. When it comes to how to invest, what is a stock, how do you liquidate a stock, what's an index fund, what's a long-term strategy, uh, what is the Jobs Act, the, you know, the Syndication Act we were talking about, how to group capital together from communities to expand out and, and have leveraged network effects. And I'll explain what that is after too. Um, but I wanted to break that down for the people and use the platform that I do have to give them that information. And I published a second book called, um, called Owning Change, and I labeled it Owning Change for a reason. And I, I didn't pick these names for anything. Broke, broken, well, college doesn't teach you about money. I look from my experience, and a lot of us now, uh, the Latinos and, and African Americans, we have the most student debt by far. And the default rates on those student debt, we have by far from every single other community. And it's not because we're dumb, it's because we don't have that information growing up. And you don't have somebody sitting there and teaching you growing up. And you can't, you don't have examples of people that you could learn from. And I wanted to make sure as I start kind of doing my thing that I give back and I do that. And if I started a brand, I wanted the brand to be centered around that. Owning Change is a book that's for kids that teaches kids the importance of saving money to invest specifically. So it's not just, hey, save money, put your money in a piggy bank. It's like, no, this is save your money to invest. And we need to do that very, we need to have that ingrained in us early um, from you know, the ages of three to five years, the most formative years. 
And that's the reason why I published that book. In addition to that, now I have this newsletter coming out uh, biweekly where I'm giving people just very digestible pieces of information, almost like a little snack of like, here's a quick blurb, a text of this is what's going on in the markets. These are the hot news. These are different applications and just breaking the game down for the people in a very simple, smart way so they can understand it. Yeah, I, I definitely want want to dive into that because I think a lot of the information that you're providing is is so valuable. And, um, you know, so I, I, I picked up I picked up your book, uh, which I was very impressed, Broke Broken. And I'm still waiting for you to sign it because you said, when I come to New York, I'm going to sign it. <laughs> and, and, you, and we didn't meet when you came to New York. So I'm still waiting for your signature. Uh, but I definitely enjoyed um, – the, the read, it was, it was pretty, you know, simple to read and simple to understand. And uh, I was able to, you know, push it forward and pass it to someone that I think would have valued that information. Um, so thumbs up on that. The owning change to me, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Cause I truly believe that financial literacy and educating um, folks of color and underrepresented communities in terms of finance and how to save money, it should start at home. And it should start at a very early age. So the fact that you created a kid's book to teach kids from very young age to learn how to save money, to me, is amazing. You should convert that into an animation, a cartoon, because um, I think kids were, would, would eat it up. At least, you know, my kids, I, I push that to my kids. Um, so let us, you know, let us know a little bit about how was that process? You have two books under your belt which is which is a huge achievement and i know there's you know tons of folks that may watch this and say okay i have an idea i want to write a book how do i write a book you know um you know is it difficult to write a book do you need a distribution do you need a publishing do you need you need all these questions that most people have when they want to write a book you know how did you figure it out how did you crack the code um and how were you able to publish uh and sell two two books so I, I use what I learned in the startup world versus what would happen in the corporate world. And what I mean by that is when, when you want to get something done, and especially something like a book, in the beginning, perfection is your enemy. And that's what kind of holds most people back. Most everybody wants to publish a book and write a book, but they kind of get stuck in the little weeds of the details. And what I did was I set up an outline of like, this is what this is a storyline. These are the flows and the chapters I want to get across. And then also thinking about the community, I'm like what's something that they're actually going to read because finance books are boring as hell. I mean, it's something boring. <laughs> right? like, it's the worst yeah. topic to write about because it's boring and it's like, it can just draw out. So I was like, I got to break this down in a way that people are actually like, if they do read it, because most people buy things and don't read it. If they do read it, they're going to understand it and be able to take one or two little things away. And that's what I wanted to make sure I get across. And I also wanted to cover the psychological component. But the way I wrote the book, and this is what I tell a lot of people, is in the beginning, once I had the outline did, I would literally record myself and break down a lot of the steps and a lot of the, the, the thoughts behind I had from a flow from a chapter, almost like a brainstorm. And then I would have that transcribed. I would edit it. And I did that for multiple chapters, multiple chapters. Multiple. Oh, okay. And I would transcribe, then I would go in and I would edit it and I would have a brainstorm. Then I tried to put the flow, I had a character in mind and I recorded. So I would say, so Claudia walks into the office, Claudia does this, Claudia does that. And the guy says this, and I recorded it all out. And then I put it into a sheet and I went to a sheet and I would edit it and I would edit it and I would edit it. Once I had that version one done, I sent it into a professional editing team to review it, to make sure they covered anything I messed up on, which is very normal practice for books. And that's what they did after I had, it took me about three months to kind of go through and actually put my ideas and not worry about perfection in the beginning, just get it done, get it out there, go through. And it's going to take four or five iterations before it's actually something that you're going to like. And like, okay, this is something I could uh, actually get out of market. And today you don't need distribution. You don't need to own, you don't need to have a publisher. You can put you, anybody can get a book out, Put it on Amazon, get it, um, buy it, uh, it's I, uh, IBSN number, which is like a serial number. And you can literally put it online and you can use freelancers to create the cover, um, create the messaging. And there's so much you can do today. And it's one for our community to understand that you don't need these things anymore. Back in the day, we had all these little gatekeepers. You want to do a book and you want it over here. Nobody was going to know about it unless you did. You went and you played the game with, with, with uh, Amazon or some of these other uh, publishers. Now you can just put them online and you can have direct access to the community. 
Um, so that's what I did. I, I rough draft template spoke brainstorm, didn't focus on, um, perfection, uh, edited it myself, sent it to professional team. They edited it and then we uploaded it and we put it online and we sold, uh, I've, I've sold a little over 5,000 copies so far and it's only been a few months and this has been me direct to the people. And it's, it's been a, for me, it's been a, one of the things I, I'd say with the proudest things I've done and same for the children's book, same children's book. Sorry if I'm rambling. No, this is amazing, man. I just, I just wanted to stop you and say, congratulations, man. It's, it's something that I know a lot of people, um, a lot of professional people have thought about, you know, writing their own book and, you know, they get stuck. Like you said, they get stuck on the little things. They get stuck on the process. They get stuck on the idea of, you know, how to distribute, you know, how to market it. You know, they just get stuck on so many things. And the fact that you were able to simplify it like you did um, is, is amazing because I learned so much just by hearing you simplify. In the entrepreneurial world, you don't need perfect in the beginning. You launch, you get it out there fast, then you iterate on feedback. You, you don't want perfect. You don't need perfect. You know, nobody's first product is perfect and, and you have to be okay with that and be okay with being vulnerable. And then you get out and you adjust. Same with the book. You don't want to get stuck in the little details of it. Get it out there and then you're going to figure it out and you're going to edit. Your people are going to tell you this is good, this is bad, then you're going to edit it again, then it's good or bad, then version 10 is going to be great. But if you get stuck in the little weeds of everything that'll be perfect, you're never going to get anything out there. Well, it's the uh, Eric Reese methodology, right? The lean yeah. startup where, you know, forget about being perfect, just... You know, have an MVP, get out to the market, start talking to your consumers, uh, learn from it and reiterate if you need to reiterate. Uh, something that a book that I read that I found so much value in it that I think um, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, get stuck in just trying to have the perfect product uh, before mm -hmm. the launch. And, and, you know, a lot of the recommendations uh, that I give is no, you know, you number one priority should get to your customer, get to your consumer. Yeah. Uh, have them provide you the feedback. And depending on their feedback, you reiterate, reiterate and you change whatever you need to change in your product. Um, but I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I want to touch a little bit more deeper into Blacklist because, you know, you have, you have you written a couple books. Uh, I'm noticing you now. You're, you're going to uh, events and you're speaking and you're on panels and you're providing a lot of information. Uh, and I want you to provide that information for free for us, for everyone who's watching this. So thank you uh, for your time. And this is, this is very, uh, very helpful. I know some people will probably put all this information behind a paywall, uh, but I'm glad, you, I'm glad you, um, you, you're able to provide that to us. So now this is a, a sports podcast. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, uh, we have a sports uh, platform and uh, we know the stories. We hear the stories of, 70%, 80% of athletes going broke um, after they play the professional level. As a um, financial person, financial advisor, financial literacy with books, speaking to people, speaking to the youth, you know, I would like to kind of frame, you know, most of the questions now and most of your answers now uh, into that athlete character, right? And you yeah. talked about character earlier. You know, an athlete, a young athlete, college, um, you know, not having much money because you're a student athlete. Um, you know, what is your recommendation for, for, for the athletes in college? Do they, should they start, you know, saving? Should they start investing in college? One. Uh, two is once you're an athlete, let's say you're making minimum, minimum income, you know, should you invest with minimal income, because most, pe most people say, well, I don't have the money to invest. I don't know how to invest. I don't know where to invest. And we're going to get into everything. We want to get into the difference between uh, stocks and the difference between investing in real estate and the different, you know, different uh, categories and different places that we can invest and some of the, uh, the tools that are out there that we can kind of help our people uh, to get a uh, better understanding and uh, better educated in terms of investing. Um, but yeah, you're a student athlete you know, you're high school or you're in college. Um, what are the, I guess, three tips that you should, uh, that they should consider as a student athlete in college? Okay, so three tips and for somebody in college, student athlete in college. So this is number one for me. And this isn't so much a financial tip as much as it is just like, you need to equip yourself with the knowledge because I think what happens with athletes is, 
you know, to be number one at anything, you got to just lock in and focus. And you got to like, I know if, as, an, as a, people who are athletes, they're just, I read Tim Grover's book, Relentless. I don't know if you read, read it, Michael Jordan's mm -hmm. coach. Nope. And um, I know athletes are just locked into what they do. And the reason why I say you need to have the knowledge is because what happens with most athletes is they trust other people that are going to take care of, whether it's an accountant, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend, and they trust them, but they don't have that. They don't know anything about finances. So it's easy for them to get tricked. So you need to at least have a basic understanding of finances, time horizon, understanding of why most players are, are go through that 70% do get bankrupt. So understanding those things and also understanding that the, the, the reason why they go broke is a time horizon for athletes. You know, most athletes have two to three years of a career where most people have 20 to 30 years of a professional career. And we all think our, our career is going to last 10 to 15, 10 years. If you're a good athlete, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years. So that's if you're lucky, that's for a very small select group of, of athletes. So you need to have that information. So when you do trust somebody, you, you trust somebody to handle your money you'll be more informed about making that decision. So one, equip yourself with the knowledge in the beginning. So you can understand a faker, somebody who's going to hustle you, versus somebody who knows what they're doing, who's professional, and who's not going to play you and rape you with fees and, and put you in a bunch of crazy stuff that they're going to pay themselves with. Because this happens so much. It's, you hear so many stories about athletes getting played by the people they trust. Um, so equip yourself with the knowledge young. So when, you, when you're out of age, you know the real and you know from the real from the BS and the fake. That's number one. Number two is be, begin testing the waters with, with investing. You know, like understand the stock market. And, but more than that, just, you know, take a few hundred dollars if you have it and put it into something. Maybe like an index fund. Go into the office. Go through the process. Young. Go through it. You know, you, you learn by doing. Get in the office and talk to somebody. And, and, and put a few, few dollars up, $5,200 into like a, an index fund, which is a fund that tracks the whole market. Not a lot of risk. And just get in the game early so you can have an understanding. And that's these three tips are made to equip you so when you do have, when you're a pro, you can protect yourself because you need to protect yourself from, from people. Um, and then third is, um, I would say, this kind of goes more towards when you are a career professional, is be weary of doing business with friends and family. And... I don't, I say this because when I was taking my uh, certified financial planner test, um, you know, one of the biggest reasons why people go through, through, you know, bankruptcies or problems in business is, especially as an athlete, is the people you're going to trust in your circle, is your cousin, is your uh, friend from high school, is, is, you know, and, and most of those times they kind of, kind of guilt you into doing a deal that maybe opening up a restaurant or a club somewhere and, you know, you do it out of almost, of, you know, this is your homie, this is your friend, this is your family member, then you end up getting screwed. So, so um, be weary, understand that if you are going to do business with friends or family, uh, very clear delineation and be okay with losing the money and don't let it get in between your relationship. Uh, absolutely. Those are some amazing uh, tips. I um, previously we interviewed one of our episodes, John Hartford, who's a professional basketball player. And he had similar sentiments. You know, he said, educating, educating yourself on understanding of how to make your money work um, and not being so dependent on a professional because you have a professional, an accountant, a lawyer that you would think, oh, he's a lawyer. He has some experience. He's not going to do me dirty, so to speak. And those are the first people that will screw you over. Uh, and we hear tons of stories of athletes being taken advantage of from these professional guys, right? Mm -hmm. You see these, these Blanquito, these white people, you're, you, you, you see they're, they're well off, they have tons of experience and they still take um, advantage of you. And then you have your friends and family that may take advantage of you. Uh, so it's a, it's a lonely world for, for athletes, unfortunate, because they're looking over their shoulders. You know, who can they trust? Um, especially once they have some money coming in, you know, because some professional people would take advantage of them. Some of their family members would take advantage of them. Um, and, you know, John mentioned, talked to you talk about educating yourself, mm -hmm. right? Understanding the value of money, understanding how to invest and how to save. And hopefully, you know, uh, being able to, to, to manage your, your money from, from, from beginning to end. Uh, so, so thank you for that. I was, you know, 
very powerful. Um, and I'm hoping that people uh, would take something from what you just mentioned and, and, and implement it into their life and to what they're doing. It doesn't matter how, how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You know, you can start with a hundred dollars. You can start with a thousand dollars. You know, a lot of people are receiving these, uh, stimulus check from the government, um, you know, $1,200, many of them have spent it already. Many of yeah. them need to spend it, right? Cause you need to pay bills. And I, I, I understand it for, but if you're, you know, 20, 22 and you've worked, you've been out of college for a couple of years and you receive the uh, stimulus check, maybe not spend it, you know, maybe not go to the club and, and buy a bottle. <laughs> pop a bottle, mm, yeah. uh, or or for the ladies, maybe not buy a, a Louis bag with that stimulus check. Maybe get that money and invest it in, and stop. Um, and I wanted to go in, you know, and, and talk a little bit more about you know what other uh, areas that people can invest outside of stocks. Um, I know you talk a lot about yeah. real estate, and you talk about a lot of uh, other uh, areas for for investment purposes. Yeah, that was going to be my next, the next thing I covered was that, you know, after you have an understanding of, you know, what the game is, is you can start breaking down of what are the different types of investment buckets and diving deeper in that is like, what is, I'm going to break this down in a way that's digestible, but like, what is the time horizon? So how long am I going to be in this thing for before I can get my money out? If I need money, like if I need cash, can I get it out? So that's time horizon. How long before I can get my like money today? Second is, um, what are the risks associated with that? So what is the risk return? So what is the chance I can lose everything? And how does the time horizon tie into that? And those are the two components to kind of think in, because when you're talking about investments, you have you know, four or five different buckets. You can have stocks, um, bonds, anything to do with the markets. You can invest in companies, right? And in companies, that's its whole other subset of intricacies and, and different things and nuances to think about. And then you can do hard assets like real estate, um, gold, maybe, you know, uh, things outside of that. Um, I think from what I've seen statistically, which happens with most athletes is they, you know, sort of give their money to one money manager and that money manager will then has like the authority. He's almost like a trustee where he's trusted to do anything he wants with it. So he has you in stocks, then he, put you in a real estate deal. He puts you into uh, maybe a, a startup that you're not aware of that, you know, has high risk, right? And these aren't people who are uh, trained and equipped to make those kind of decisions. So um, you really need to be careful and you really need to assess two things. Time horizon, when can I get my money out? Like when, can, when is my cash gonna be, like when can I get my cash? Secondly, what is the risk? And another thing to think about is what types of investments pay me something today? And that's a good thing about real estate, right? You get into multifamily real estate, it cash flows today. So even if I can't get my money out in 10 years to liquidate it through the time horizon, I can, I'm getting a check today, right? And that's something to think about too. And maybe that check can help pay for some of my lifestyle. Um, the, the complex part for athletes is where, where do you get this kind of information from somebody you can trust? That's going to allow you to be a celebrity, have a busy lifestyle, you know, play sports, travel. It's almost impossible to manage your money and do that. But where can you get this information? Have somebody you can actually trust to do it. And you have to be very careful because, in my opinion, the league doesn't care. Many of the leagues care. If they cared, why would 70, 80 percent of people go bankrupt? Yep. They don't. It's a business for them. They look at you like a nub. You're coming in and then once you're done, you're done. So you have to educate yourself because they're not going to do it. And if you go broke, they don't care. They're the first one you get injured, they cut you, they trade you, you know, they kind of work in all these. This is why you need agents. Right. And the thing too, is your agent should not be your, to me. And I've seen this before. Cause I told you we were, I was organizing a deal with MLB and I had a ton of meeting with, I went to the MLB winter meeting in San Diego and I met with all, I met with so many of the names, you know, and I met with a lot of these agents and I saw, I have an understanding of how the game works is to me, I don't want my agent to be my financial advisor. I want it to be very separate. My agent is you get me the contract, but I don't want that living in one house. I want him to be an expert here. I want my real estate person to be an expert in real estate. I want my investment person to be an expert in real estate. And then I want to do research on all their backgrounds and do a very deep check. What's their track record? Who else are you working with? What type of investments are you getting? And that's the same for the startup world. So if you want to get into venture capital and you want to create your own fund and you want to get into startups, so this is venture capital funds are 
our funds that invest into different entrepreneurs from different communities at different stages. I want to go with somebody who knows that stage, who has experience. I don't want to give it to an agent. An agent doesn't know anything about that. An agent knows how to get you the contract and they kind of Google all this stuff and they, they have a way to kind of suck fees out of you. So, and that's the same thing, by the way, with every single one of these. Every single one of these entities are designed to suck fees, suck your money out so they can get paid. And hopefully in return, you're going to make some money. But at the end of the day, you, you got to remember your money is the one that's really at risk. They get their fees and they move on. If you lose money, they're going to just move on to get somebody else. So to break that down in simple terms is for an MLB athlete, my agent's my agent. My financial advisor is my financial advisor. And I want to vet this financial advisor to a T to a point of what's your clients, what's a long-term strategy. This has something called what's called the Monte Carlo simulation. And this is like, what is a simulation? What's going to happen if my, if my account drops 15, 20% in the next five, 10 years? What's the historical mix of this, this investments that I got into when it comes to stock bonds? That's just a Monte Carlo simulation. And what's a full-fledged plan for you? With a two, if my money drops 10%, if I get fined from the league and I get injured, all those models need to be factored in. You're my real estate guy, great. Are you a multifamily person? Are you a single family person? Where are you investing? What's the internal rate of return? So how much of these things are you gonna pay me at the end of the deal? What is this cash flow today? And I need to understand that you need to have a deep understanding of this before I give you my money because, because again, I may have a 10 year career, I may have a one year career. So I have to know all this stuff from the beginning into all those components. You know, as time as times pass, more and more athletes are becoming more aware and more educated. Um, there's a few athletes that I that jump out on me in terms of uh, they understand their brand. Um, they do an amazing job investing. Uh, very uh, have a very diverse portfolio. Um, you hear about LeBron James. You hear about Kevin Durant and Steph Curry uh, and all the big name athletes. And you hear some of the you know, white athletes. Uh, but I think in the Latino athletes, you know, we, we're at the bottom. Um, I mm -hmm. think many of our Latino athletes, maybe it's because of lack of uh, education here in the U S maybe it's because of their, their language. Um, and many of them, you know, still resign and live in, in their native country. You know, they come here, yeah. they play for six months, you know, and they still have, you know, homes and family in their country. These leagues and these professional organizations, they don't give a fuck about you after you, once you're in there and you do your thing, you're gone from that, right? And we've seen that over and over and over again, even with a lot of the racial injustice things that are happening now, it's marketing dollars. So they don't really give a fuck. So you need to protect yourself. And the main recommendation, it's very similar to the athletes here because the Morenos go through it too, is the people that's giving you the advice, your friends, your family members, your, your primo, your, they, they're not well versed in this game. And you can using the internet, using use leverage that. And, and if you need to find somebody who's in Spanish, you can even Google uh, you know, financial advisor in Espanol, right? Or Latino financial advisor in Miami. Miami's a hub of it. They got a lot of Latinos there. And you interview them and you, you vet them and you, you go through third party sources too. So you don't just take that, you don't just automatically go with them. Don't make any decisions emotionally. But I would say is don't trust anybody in the beginning. Don't trust anybody. Don't make it so you have to trust them, verify. Bet the hell out of them. And then once you once they have your money, you hold, you hold almost like a gun to their motherfucking head and understand the fees and the structures. This goes through the same for, for, for my players in Santo Domingo. The players in Santo Domingo, you know, and I know they have a lot of the, the camps and people kind of working through. It's the same thing. You need to break out of the system. Anything that the system's telling you, the people that are, are putting you in those camps, it, they're, they're, their incentives are aligned short run, right? And they're, they're, their incentives are aligned to suck money out of you. And I hate to say it that way. I say it in the most brutal way. But they want you to go pro, not because they like you, because they think they're going to get a lot of money out of you. So you need to, which is maybe okay, because they trust you in events, investing but you have to protect yourself and use the internet now is the biggest tool that's going to be there for you because you can literally search verified sources online, set up meetings and calls with them. And you can even just get one or two and then pin their advice against each other, right? Say, okay, this guy's telling me this, but this guy's telling me this. So what's the good, what's the bad, where, where can I get screwed over? What, what's the fee structure? And that's what the main thing I said, where, what are these people trying to take out of me and what's their strategy? And is our long-term strategy um, aligned? 
I hate to talk in finance, talk like that. But I think the main thing I want to tell the athletes from all ages, from all countries, is when you become a celebrity, when you become a star, when you become a professional athlete, you must protect yourself from the league, from friends and family. You become a target from mujer, you know, from women, you all of a sudden you go out and uh, everywhere you go, you're now a target. And you know, money changes people. And money, was, money amongst family changes people. So what you think money from everywhere else, it's gonna be that times 20. So you have a, uh, even a bigger responsibility to educate yourself and be very weary of the advice that friends and family give you. And also that the league gives you because it's gonna be very short run. Um, if you're in Mexico, if you're in Santo Domingo, use the internet to a max. I would recommend you reach out to, to communities that normally are used to dealing with Latino athletes, which is going to be Miami and Florida and New York, and maybe even a little bit of LA. I know Los Angeles has a little bit, um, a little bit in San Diego too, but I know in um, Miami specifically, there's so many agents down there. There's so many financial advisors that deal with athletes, Spanish speaking athletes, and you can literally look them up and they'll, they would love nothing more than to set up time with you. Right. But when you, when you go on these conversations, always go in understanding that, you know, these people, um, they may not always have your best interest. And that number 70 to 80% for me, if, was, if I owned that league, that number would be unacceptable. It's, it's a stupid number because most of the people getting into leagues come from, you know, they're Latinos, they come from, or they come from, uh, they're Moreno. And we tend to be the ones that keep getting screwed over, over and over and over and over and over because we don't even know what we're getting into, Right. And if they cared, they would knock this shit out right away because this shit's so easy to knock out. This shit should be so easy. There's no reason why any athlete should be going broke, bankrupt within two years after leaving the league. Two fucking years. That's crazy. It's, cra it's so crazy. I mean, you made millions of dollars, even if you made $500,000. There's no reason why any player from any country, from any league, any type of sport should be going broke in that time frame. Nobody goes broke in that time frame. Two years. That's just that. Right? So you need to trust and verify and, and be mistrusting. Love your circle, love the people around you, but be aware, use the street smart, be aware. Trust the specialists and use the internet. And Latinos, Miami, big hub. Miami's got everything you need. Florida's got everything you need. New York and other places here too, but specifically for Latinos. And then do background checks, leverage other, I would be reaching out to other professional athletes and have them mentor me, the ones that have done well. I, and they would, and they like that. People like to kind of have the ego stroke. Reach out to other players that been there and done that that did not go broke, and they will personally introduce you to their people. So follow people who've been successful. Let them introduce you to their people in their camp, and you know you can trust them. But don't go blind. Don't trust friends or family, and um, be very, 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 very careful. Especially double if you're coming from Mexico and Santo Domingo. If you're getting from Mexico and Santo Domingo. I would, I would only go through referrals, to be honest with you. I wouldn't trust anybody blank. It's like, I'd be calling, I would try to get in touch with A-Rod, I would try to get in touch with Bujols, I would get in touch with any, any or even second or third tier hitters. Say, hey who, hey, who do you recommend I go with? What mistakes did you make? And learn from them, because they're going to know the little intricacies of the league. And they're going to know, say, hey, Mira, I know, be careful with this guy. This guy screwed this guy over. They're going to know that little behind-the-scenes detail. And you have to, you have no choice but to do that. You know, what do you think that Latino athletes specifically are lacking um, and are not, and are some of the reasons why they're not investing in, in venture and, and in tech um, and in entrepreneurs? Deal, deal flow and, and the knowledge of the game, right? There's not a really a soundboard to like what, you were, you're, what you're trying to organize is amazing because there needs to be somebody who, who understands the game and who, can get, who understands deal flow and how to find the right deals and find the right angel investors and getting into getting you know access to, to hot companies, right? We can actually kind of go in and, and um, lead a, a good good round and, and build a good fund. You know, there's nobody really doing that, and especially from the Latino community. There's a few venture capital funds, but they, they don't really mess with the people like that, right? Um, so there's, a, there's just a need for somebody who knows the game, who can be a soundboard, and who can structure deals where people can trust. And who also understands the deal flow side is how do, how do you actually access the right companies and, and find the right entrepreneurs and know what to look for. And, and um, you know, that hasn't existed, I think, is more Latinos kind of go into the space. And, I, and it's not just any Latinos, too. I try to give, you know, folks examples of, obviously, the, the Zuckerbergs of the world, 
you know, Larry Page and the Google and the guys from Google's of the world and trying to, you know, let these guys know this could be you, you know, you as a seed investor, as an initial investor to a startup launched by a Latino, um, you, your return could be X, you know, if you can, you know, give some examples yeah. of, of what there's you, been people who've invested a thousand dollars that it turns to 500 million, for example, right. In the right company, Uber is one of those companies. I know Google was one of those companies where 1000 to 5,000 can turn easily turn to a hundred million, can turn to half a billion. Um, so when you're talking about risk and you're talking about investing in, in um, a, like a founder, an entrepreneur, um, yes, it's more risky, but the upside is obviously going to mitigate that risk. And that's the risk return thing that you want to, that um, people need to understand. Now, the way you mitigate risk for a venture fund, and this is how venture funds justify that risk, and they, they cut the risk of you losing your money, is the same concept that goes into all of finance and all of stocks. It's diversification, right? So when you're building a fund, whether you're concentrated on, you know, Latino healthcare founders, Latino uh, media conglomerate founders, right? You want to invest in a ton of those founders within each uh, group, which is called diversification. And when you diversify, you're betting that one of those founders within that group, or one of the company within that fund is going to return, you know, 50 to 100 X, 50 to 100 times what you put in, while the others may go even or may fail, you might lose a little bit of money. But the return from this one big company, that Google, that the, the Latino Google that comes out, you become, uh, you know, hundred million or it's the best $5,000 you ever spent in your life, right? And that's how you mitigate the risk is you diversify and kind of across tons of different founders. And we need to do this because we, we can build those kind of companies. I'm out here all the time. I see this little blanquito, like Arito, they're 22, they're 23. The founder of Stripe, I'm looking at them like, what the fuck? We got so many talented hustlers in our community that don't have access to money that we could do that times 20. Look at the shit we do. We come from Santo Domingo and you go to New York, there's tons of Dominican businesses everywhere, right? All over the place. And this was a no capital, nothing. So if we get behind the right people. And again, you got to get around, you got to give money to enough people, right? To find that one person who's going to do it. And the that one person exists. There's tons of us. There's tons of people out there that are doing it. But we need access to the capital and we need to see somebody like you who understands how to organize deals and understands how to, how to, what to look for in a person to invest and really understands the technology landscape that will, will drop the, the chances of you losing your money. And if you do it correctly, you won't lose money because you understand who to invest in and, who, who, and um, what sectors to invest in and et cetera that return could be a thousand X, 10,000 yeah, X yeah. Uh, of your investment. I don't think there's any other investment that can provide that return. Um, and it was, it's, it's been, you know, it's been unfortunate that a lot of people of color were unable to participate um, in these types of opportunity, these types of deal flow uh, until Obama passed the, the, the jobs act. And I know you, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned offline, you mentioned it and, you know, I would love for you to go into a, you know, what is that Jobs Act? You know, why is it or why should it be so important to um, underrepresented people and, and entrepreneurs and, and people of color? Yeah, so uh, I'll break this in two components and, and why the Jobs Act important and why everybody should invest in, in startups and in um, entrepreneurs. I'll break it down in two. So one, the, the Jobs Act. Before the Jobs Act, if you wanted to invest in uh, a venture company, because it's risky, you had to be a you had to be in a what's called an accredited investor, meaning you need to make I think it was like two hundred over two hundred thousand dollars a year, or be net worth, worth a million. Yep, net worth a million, right? And if you didn't have that, you couldn't invest not only in startups, but there was hedge funds, private equity deals. There are certain deals that you couldn't get into. And by the way, in these deals, these are the best money, man. These are people who know what they're doing, and this is why they can charge those kind of fees. And the people could never get into those deals. So the people who made money off of Google. The real people who made real money off of Google and Facebook and all this stuff were the accredited investors. And they became, this is why we have the big income inequality, thing, right? And the Jobs Act allowed, allows people who are non-accredited investors to now get into those deals through syndicates or fundraising. I mean, sorry, crowdfunding. And that's what the Jobs Act allows you to do. 
the reason why this is point two, or the reason why you do want to invest into uh, venture backed uh, companies, you want to invest in uh, every one of us in almost everything is you do when you manage your money, you want to have a strategy and you want to have what's the core, the meat. And this is what you would say is the part where you don't want to take as much risk. Right. So if you have, if you have a hundred thousand, you want to put 50,000 in the stock market and something that's just going to ride it out. Right. Then you take 20,000 and you put it into real estate. Right. And then you take, another uh, 20,000 in this part. So 75% is gonna be relatively safe. Take this 25% and put it into entrepreneurs. And if you get all the athletes doing that, if you have all the athletes say, okay, this is in the stock market, this is in uh, real estate, and then this 20 to 25% now is gonna go to startups, you know, great. If you're gonna get good returns in your stocks, you're gonna get a return in your real estate, and if you hit a home run over here, all of a sudden, and this 20,000 is not worth three to four million. So you just, you're killing the game with very little risk because you're only taking a small piece of your money. $20,000 is not a little bit of money, but it's not everything. And you can just take that, that 20,000 and put it into a venture backed company. And if hundreds of people do that, all of a sudden, that's a lot of money, right? And if you're an athlete and you sign a million dollar deal, all of a sudden it's 250,000 you can put into a venture backed company. So the risk is, is, is your risk is lower. So you're not going to, the main pool of your money is not going to be put into the higher risk, but you're still getting that upside, right? You're, one of those companies is going to break even at least. One of them is going to be the next big thing and you're going to be able to get a piece of that. And that's why you want to do venture backed companies. You want exposure to every part of, of the sector, uh, every part of the economy. And another thing too to think about is each part is uncorrelated. And this is the other side too. This is why you want to be in different things. When commercial real estate, uh, goes up, this type of real estate goes down. When the stock market goes up, bonds go down. When bonds go up, stock market goes down. And it kind of like, there's a there's a, a professional strategy that you want to understand is the same thing with startups. Startups do well, they get very well funded when the interest rates are low. Money now is free, right? And if you, if you can get access to money, you're paying very low, low interest rates on it. There's never been a better time for founders to raise money. It's never been cheaper to raise money. And it's never been better for venture back people to, to uh, invest in founders because, especially like founders from our communities, because the most talented hustler, the people who are making it out of our communities, they're not going into Wall Street. They're not going, they're now in tech. They're very entrepreneurs. Everybody wants to build a company. Everybody wants to Facebook. Every, there's so many applications out there. Everybody's trying to get into this game. And there's a huge technological revolution happening. And COVID now sped this up quickly. Healthcare is going to be sizzling up. Healthcare is so hot right now. We're going to have the best healthcare in the next five years. Um, you know, anything with uh, supply chains, um, anything when it comes to um, distribution, there's just so many new things that are happening because of the COVID situation that um, we need to have people in our community be leading those and actually, because they understand how to service our community, right? And um, I would, one of the things now I'm getting into a lot of debates around is, you know, we can start our own league. We can start Latinos, can start our own baseball league. Why not? Let's raise money, start our own league. Right? Or the NBA players should now that we have, now that we're in this moment where there's unrest, we need to own that and we need to back each other. We need to put capital money in our community. We need to have the Black Wall Street like we had in the day. And we need to have people going to look out for us because we're going to keep fighting for ours to them and they're just going to give us, we're going to have to blow the whole country up to get even a seat at the table. This is very, very important. So, one, from a diversification strategy, from a risk strategy, you need to get into startups. You need to have a, a percentage of what you're doing, whether it's 5% or 4% or 10%, that money needs to go into startups. Um, outside of that, you need to also do it from a, a, a community perspective because we need to start backing each other. We need to start backing each other because when my company blows up, I'm going to be hiring, you know, I hate to say this, I'm going to be hiring Latinos, I'm going to be hiring brothers, I'm going to be hiring different you know, that's what I'm gonna do with that money. I'm not gonna go back and, and keep the game, keep the money in certain communities. I'm gonna try to put on, I'm gonna go back to Boston. I'm gonna open up a big ass office in Boston. I'm gonna hire everybody from the community, retrain and reskill them and get everybody up and running. It's never gonna get equal until we start doing that. So we need to start backing each other. We need to start, and especially backing entrepreneurs with our money. I don't remember the last stat, but I think it's, it's $2.7 trillion buying power GDP, however you, however yeah. you, 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 you pronounce it. So just to the people that are watching this interview, 
um, and understand the power that we as U.S. Hispanic have, right? So if you were to group all the U.S. Latino in the United States um, and make them an independent country, they would be the seventh largest country in the world. They would have more money than India, than Brazil, than Mexico, than Canada, uh, than France. Like, you know, the U.S. Latino um, controls more money than most of the countries in the world. Uh, but yet we, we don't know. We don't know that. We don't know the power that we have. Um, and I think, you know, and I applaud people like you who are in the front lines educating the youth and educating our community and saying, hey, let's get shit straight. You know, yeah. let's get educated. You know, let's understand how to manage money um, and let's invest and let's keep that dollar, keep that money in our community. Give us three books that you recommend um, and keep in mind that we may have, you know, some young people that, you know, may be watching this video. We have some aspiring athletes uh, in high school and college and maybe, you know, minor league athletes watching this video. You know, what books do you recommend that they should uh, read that will help them um, understand money, that will help them understand, you know, their finances? I would say get my book. And I, I hate of to say course. that. And the reason why I say it is, most books, the, the top books in this category are Intelligent Investor, which is going to break down portfolio and all these little, and it's boring. It's like 300 pages long and nobody ever reads it. That's why nobody even knows anything about this thing. because It's all written for like Wall Street people. So I would say get some books, any book by Dave Ramsey on budgeting, credit, and I think he makes all the stuff that people can actually understand. My book is different from what Dave Ramsey is going to tell you because Dave Ramsey is going to tell you like, don't have Starbucks, stay at home, don't spend any money and cut all your bills to zero, right? And it's a different mindset um, where I'm going to tell you the opposite. I'm going to say, my book's going to teach you about how to invest, um, how to take like risk, but take risk in a smart way. And it's going to break down, it's going to break down the game in a way they can actually understand. You're actually going to read it because it's easy to read. And that's, that's the first book I would start off with. Um, when it comes to uh, the startup world, I think, uh, a good book that's short, that's easy to understand, and that will kind of break down the game of how technology works, which every athlete should understand technology. You have to today. Um, is Zero to One by Peter Thiel. And I would read that because it just understands, the, it will just give you a breakdown of the, the game entirely. And then I think third, I, I would get a book, um, and this is kind of random, I get a book on Gary V. I I think it's called Jab Left, Jab Right. And the reason, left hook, right hook, something like along those lines. The reason I would get it as an athlete and as a younger person today is because we are becoming, you are a company going forward. Whether you're an athlete, whether you're somebody young, like using media, using technology, using um, whatever platform you're going to have in the future is your company, you're a brand, and you need to learn how to build that over time. And you need to understand how to use the channels that we do have, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, and not just use them, don't consume it, but how to create it. Let the people that are watching this know, you know, how can they reach you? Uh, what's the best uh, avenue to reach you in case they want to buy your book? Um, they want to listen to your podcast. They want to be part of your newsletter. Um, they may have some questions. Uh, they may want to learn more. How can, um, how can someone reach you? The cold, the cold outreach, right? How can someone, uh, well, what's look, the, best, the best approach, the best uh, avenue to reach you? I do it different than everybody. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give people the best way to reach me, which is my cell. My, this is this cell phone right here. And this number, I'm gonna, I'll give it off first. And I always encourage people to call me or text me directly. If I can't pick up, I always respond to everything. But my number is 857 770 8204. So if you have any questions, shoot me a text. I'll answer them directly. And it'll be coming for me. It's going to come from that. I have two phones, and, and this phone is the one I mainly use. It's my personal one. So it's 857 770 8204. On Instagram, it's uh, at Pedro M. Frias, F R I A S. And then my site is www.blacklist.co. And I have, um, there's going to be the project I'm going to be launching is going to be called. Telelink, and it's going to be um, in the healthcare sector, and it's going to be focused on the Latinos connecting us to the right care. 
in that application. The technology is being built out now, so I'll have a site up for that, and you can also uh, reach me there. And I want what I want to do it there is the main use case we're trying to get behind that is increase access to care and increase the positive outcomes for people. And we're gonna there's that little gap where people are not understanding where to find the services, and we're just gonna fill that gap with this tech. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. Uh, looking forward to um, hearing more about uh, this new application you're working on. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I want to give you my, my, my thanks. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on. This uh, has been amazing. I've learned so much today. Um, looking forward to having you on again in the future. And maybe we can have a round table where we can invite some athletes and they can ask you questions and we can have a conversation and back and forth and hopefully we can, you know, help our Latino athletes, you know, that I think that I need that support. I need people like you that are providing that information and providing that, that contact and that education. Uh, so thank you again uh, for, for coming on and, you know, however I can do, however we can do as a platform uh, to help promote you, uh, help promote what you're working on. Um, please let us know and we'll definitely, uh, we'll definitely do. Definitely. And vice versa. Uh, uh, you know, I think offline we can talk about some of the things, but there's, there's a lot of uh, ways I think we can work together and stuff you're working on. So look forward to Absolutely. That. Thank you so much. So uh, I'll talk to you soon. Have a good night. You too. Talk to you soon.